everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics Podcast. I got my special guest, Mr. Pornsack, P. Shashot. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, Pornsack, I've been practicing to make sure that I get that right. Uh, out of respect to you and everything you accomplished, I can't uh, can't wait to have a conversation with you, man. I'm super excited. You are a very accomplished uh, comic book writer slash TV, everything else, man. It, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. No, no, it's, I'm really glad uh, I could jump on board for this. I, uh, you were able, I think it was last week, you were able to interview Jesse, yep. and I was bummed I couldn't uh, be there for that because I cannot handle the math of working, of going through different time zones, apparently, <laughs> is what I've learned through all this. And uh, But yeah, but I'm really glad I had a chance to talk to you now. Awesome, Porn Zach. Well, I appreciate it. I, I thought maybe, uh, I mean, I've seen some of your interviews and you probably are like at nausea talking about certain things because you talk about it constantly. But man, I would <laughs> love to know um, from a storytelling standpoint, like where did that kind of ability and that desire to kind of tell stories begin in your life? Is that something that was like early age where you were trying to tell stories or is it something that maybe a teacher in high school or university did? What, what happened there? That is, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, the need to tell stories probably came more from anything from like this compulsive need to be entertaining. So now the question, I know that's a really good question. I don't know where that came from necessarily. I I think it eventually became clear that, um, well, you know what? I, okay. So, and it's funny because I say this as I'm like back home in Thailand, I don't know if, if stories were necessarily it, but language was a big deal for me. So um, when I was a kid, I, you know, when I was like 12, i my family moved us back to Thailand. And so and I was kind of thrust. And even though I was in an English speaking school, I um, I was surrounded by Thai, Thai kids who spoke Thai fluently. That was the language in the playgrounds and anything that wasn't the classroom. And so so that was all. Um, and, and for me, and, and it's funny, even now I'm, I'm back home now, obviously, and it still sort of feels like it. Um, I had such a rudimentary command of the language. And even now as an adult, and maybe there are other people who are multilingual who can speak to this, because of my rudimentary command as a language, even now, I feel infantilized when I, when I come back home, when I have to speak Thai, because my Thai never progressed past like a sixth grade level or an eighth grade level or whatever that level was. It never matured because I don't use it as much. And so... And, and so for me, language was my way of just getting control of, you know, just my life and all, and all that. In stories, um, this isn't, doesn't necessarily tap into sort of how I got into storytelling, but stories became a really big, comics and television became a really big important thing in my life. Because when I moved here, uh, part of what happened when I moved here was that I was 12. My mom and dad said, hey, we're moving to Thailand for a year. A year became two years, became three years. And then me and my sister were like, oh, wait, like mom and dad just like straight up moved us to Thailand. They just didn't want an argument. So um, and so and so me stabilizing myself was I went to comics and I went to television and to try to figure out how they worked with this idea. I a professor would psychoanalyze me later, just this idea of like, oh, there's a part of you that felt if you could figure out how they were, you'd understand the person you'd be if you never left. And so I think that was where the importance of stories in my life came in. And the importance of language was me just having control over things where I just didn't have them at the time. And so now, even now, when I have to speak in language that isn't English, I feel out of control. I don't feel like a fully functioning adult. And, and I'm sure other people don't feel that way, but, but, but that's how I do. So I think a lot of that is where that, the need to sort of be entertaining, you know, looking at stories to such a sort of degree, all that kind of came in and that sort of probably led to this urge to tell stories. That's awesome, man. Do you remember the first story that you heard that had a huge impact on you? Oh, God. I don't remember the first story I told that had a huge impact I do don't I I don't I do remember though um when I was in college or freshman college and that was before I knew I wanted to professionally tell stories I took a English class and there was a very simple assignment there was just like pick a person pick a person in the class 
interview them, write something about them. Kind of, it was very, very simple, um, very elementary. And I was sweating it. And I think my friends were wondering like why I was sweating it. And I, looking back now, I know it's because like that language was how I kept. And, and I think also too, there was a part of me like if I wasn't good at this, then why was I going to school and back to school in America? Like what was the point of all that? So, um, so for I think for me, there was a lot more on the line than me just writing this uh, the, the story. Um, and then so I wrote a story, and I there was a, like a creative sort of spin to it, and the person who I wrote it about, like felt this kinship with me that definitely, like, I'm not saying like we, it's not that we weren't like friendly. We had the interview, we were friendly, we liked each other. But then after I wrote that, it was, it was, it was, she would treat me as if I was like her best friend. And then that was the first time I realized like, oh, wow, telling a story can change, can, can made this person believe that we were closer than we actually were. And that probably was the first time I understood like, oh, wow, there's an actual power in, in storytelling. Yeah. No, absolutely. There's there's power in storytelling. Um, I, I know, you know, and maybe you experienced this too, but, you know, there's certain movies throughout time that have this impact on you and and you remember certain things of those movies the rest yeah. of your life. You know what I mean? Maybe not the yeah. whole movie, but there's certain things that happen in that movie where it's just super impactful. Um, I remember uh, my dad taking me to see Full Metal Jacket, which is probably not oh a God. movie to take a, a young person. Wow. Through. But the the impact that that the storytelling and the movie and the just the gore and everything about it had a huge impact on me. And of course, I got enthralled into all those type of movies for a long time because of the impact that it had. Do, do you know what movie had that kind of impact on you where you just kind of dove right into those type of movies? Was it anime? Was it uh, a love story? Like, is there something that had that kind of impact on you? Yes. And, uh, and no one would, I used to tell people this all the time and, and I, I just sort of stopped. Uh, I think I saw like Mannequin like 15 times growing up. <laughs> Love and that. I don't know what it is about it. I think there was part of it, like they lived in the mall. Yeah. They got married in the mall. So there was that. I think there was that whole Pygmalion sort of thing. I think there was a very big theme of just like an artist changing like changing their world around them and like, the power of art so i think that you know had a lot to do with it but uh but yeah no for me mannequin i saw that so much sort of and again because that was around i think i saw it while i was in america the first time around and then but it but then in theaters i think even and then by the time i got to it in, in in thailand it was on tape and so because they didn't have access to a lot i would watch it over and over and over again because i didn't have access to many movies so i think that too was a little lifeline back to my, my old life in america uh, and, and i didn't have access to much else so it was a movie i watched a lot that's awesome man <laughs> mannequin i would have never guessed that either for a sec yeah yeah there's no <laughs> there's no through line to anything that i do i, I, love I need it. to bring it back I, I love it. That is so awesome, man. So when when did uh so obviously you're an Eisner winner, the good Asian, um, just exploded huge, huge uh um just story. Uh I mean, maybe you can kind of get into that. I've seen some of your interviews and the way that you talk about the good Asian and the impact that that story had on you and the impact that you wanted it to have on the readers, I think is obviously has come through. Um, can you kind of talk about when that story was developed um, in your mind and when you started to put it to paper? Like, how did that all come about? It was a long process, um, primarily because um, what I have a tendency of doing is uh, I, I, I overbook myself. And so what ends up happening is there's this thing I really want to tell, but I'm too booked up with what I'm currently working on. And so the, the reward of getting through the work is, is the next story, the time the story I really want to tell. And then by the time I'm working on it, I get excited about the next thing kind of thing. So for me, uh, uh, it, it was a while before I got to, to write it. Um, I think uh, the, the, the first glimmers of the idea happened in 2016, around September 2016. I remember that because that was when my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And when my dad passed away, um, he was very, very, very into China. He was everything. About, he was Chinese. He was part Chinese. And uh, he was half Chai, half, half, half Chinese, and he was very into sort of his Chinese heritage. He didn't speak Chinese, China, 
he didn't speak Chinese and he didn't go back to China very often, but he was very into that heritage, especially during his later years. And so for me, part of sort of processing his loss was like getting into this thing that he's, he was very interested in. And that was when I learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that I thought was actually absolutely fascinating. And, and I think it hit me relatively quickly how funny it was that that happened during the same time that characters like Charlie Chan and Mr. Moto and uh, Mr. Wong Detective were very popular. And it, it, that's when the idea is like, oh, to do something like that, but integrate the reality of the Chinese Exclusion Act and America's sort of like Asian ban that was happening. That was when the first glimmers of that happened. But then it was a, uh, but I had other things I was working on at the time. And so it just kind of percolated and I would slowly, you know, as I was working on other stuff, I had time to read things and, and I, everything I read would be sort of research for, for it. So it, it would be a long time before getting the idea and actually putting pen to paper because it took a while to just understand all that history and even figure out how to approach and attack the, 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 the challenge of the book. Yeah, incredible. And did you expect it to have the fanfare that it did? Did you know right when you wrote it that it was a winner? Uh, or were you kind of caught oh, by surprise at how it took off? Yeah, no, I was totally caught by surprise. I'm still, I had no, I, I was convinced I was going to lose my shirt on the book. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no clue, no clue it's going to have those. I mean, I'll be honest, even now, yeah. like, like it, it's funny, like you sort of say that just like the, you know, the book had the fanfare that it did. Even now, I'm just kind of like, get it? I got, I did, because like when you, you know, when you're in the middle of, it's part of like the the flip side of the echo chamber, right? It's like yeah. all you hear are the your friends and people you know saying things about it. So you're just like, is it just like everybody I know? And so then occasionally I would get get people like you, like you know, we just met today, and, like, and you talk about the family. It's like, oh, maybe it is more than just like my close friends and people that I know. Uh, so yeah, so even now I'm still like, did it? But it, yeah, yeah. So so I, but it was a shock. It was absolutely a shock. Well, we're still talking about a porn sex, so it certainly <laughs> had an impact uh, um, in a very positive way, I think. Uh, I think that kind of a story, right, was fairly unknown for uh, most specifically, I would think, yeah. comic book readers. Um, so yeah. to, to have that kind of education and that kind of understanding um, through a book like The Good Asian, I think was... Yeah, it's it's going to I think it's going to have fanfare for a while because it's still very, uh, I think, up to date that story as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. No, I think five years part of, I think. yeah, I think part of the certainly the inspiration of writing the book was it was a way to talk about uh, sort of Asian American themes and Asian American experience now. And part of where I was coming from was there was no way to talk about it, talk about where we are as Asian Americans now without like sort of acknowledging what had happened in the history and kind of what got us here. And one of the things I had seen, and I feel like I still see, is as many, uh, you know, as, as progressive and as, as many steps forward there is in, in so many of those issues, a lot of them feels like step backs, uh, primarily because it almost seems like it's, the steps forward are done in a vacuum in terms of like what our history was. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, and, and it's something that I don't think we think about too often. So it's, again, you know, a topic like this, I think is really important to, to cover and to have a book like that, that kind of highlights that I think is an easier way to bring those type of topics, I think, to most people, right? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. hopefully. I mean, that's certainly the goal of that. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you have the, the good Asian that exploded. Um, you also have this unique, um, experience as an editor too um if i'm not mistaken you did a little bit with was it vertigo mm -hmm. so can you kind of talk about so you you're, you're yeah, the yeah, yeah i spent about seven years there yeah and then so and then an editor what like which side of the the spectrum do you like better the the writing storytelling side or did you enjoy the editor side where you're maybe guiding and mentoring and maybe making certain changes to ensure that the best quality goes out to the public. Like the differences between the two, which one did you like better or they're just different? They're just different. I like both of them. I really yeah. loved editing. I just really loved editing. There, it was, um, you know, there, 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 I mean, editing, you just get to be a friend. You get people, get to be people's friend and you get to see people that you have a lot of faith in and try to find a way to help them fulfill their potential you know and that's the great thing about being an editor 
Um, as a writer, I, 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 you know, I see myself as a mediocre writer held up by a good editor. Like I have the benefit of as an editor kind of coming into my own stuff and being like, okay, this is what to do. But I'm, I've gotten very used to at this point being able to diagnose problems very quickly. And I trust my instincts when it comes to that. And so, and, and, and I have an editor that I work with as well. So even when I'm working with my own stuff to be able to go back to my editors, like, am I right that this isn't working? Or, or if he says like this, and was like, I know I thought that wasn't working either. So, um, so my writing process, my, in, my editor is very much involved with the writing process. And if anything, part of, um, I think Robert Rodriguez has this thing where, um, he talks about the difference between morning writers and night writers. Uh, he was talking about it in Rebel Without a Crew. And he says, for morning writers, you get a lot out in the morning because your inner editor hasn't woken up yet. And so as a result, you just get a bunch of stuff. And then your inner editor wakes up and says, this is all crap. And then you slow down a little bit and all that kind of stuff. Um, night writers, on the other hand, you your inner editor has been working so hard that by the night, by the time night comes, he's exhausted. And so that's when you're, you can get a bunch of stuff on the page before he can get the energy up to say this is crap. And, and there's a lot of that for me. And so uh, part of my process as a writer is, and I think it's part of the process of writing in general, is just finding ways to trick myself into getting work done, is to find my ways to convince my editor that I'm not actually working so he doesn't have to stress out about anything until it's time for him to stress out about anything. You know, so he, he, gets, he gets to the job when there are words on the page. And when there are no words on the page, my work is trying to con trick myself into putting words on the page without having him like take it, tear it apart. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> my next question is being an editor, does that make being a writer easier or does it make it harder because there's more like focus on all the details maybe, or you're, you're a little bit harder on yourself because of that editor side? I, I, I think I've learned how, to make it easier for myself. I think it was a process trying to figure out how to get words on the page when all I want to do is sort of tear it apart. And then part of writing for a minute now has been, oh, here's how I can do it. So my editor is a is a strength and not a weak and not a weakness. And, and now I, I definitely profit. I mean, once the words are on the page, I'm definitely profiting from the editor side of me. The editor side of me knows what to fix. The editor side of me uh, is guiding me throughout to be to be kind of like, all right, here's a good idea. How can you, you know, the inner editor is the one that asks, who's the audience for, for this? Do you know who the audience is? Should you know who the audience is? And and he's the one that is finding uh, the great, uh, the finding the right, just constantly think about the right way to platform the story so it can reach the most audiences. So once the words are on the page, the editor side of me is great. It's it's again, it's figuring out how to get words on the page while he's there. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, you know, I also uh, saw that you, I am assuming have worked with maybe Jeff Johns on some of the WB stuff. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah, that is correct. So that's it. What correct. was that experience like and what properties? I think you were on The Flash, if I'm not mistaken. What else did you work on throughout that time frame? I mean, I pretty much worked on like all of their, for the, when it was up and coming, all of uh, DC's television slate. So there was all the Arrowverse up until I think Super, when the Super, the first season of Supergirl came out, that's when I, my, me leaving coincided with the first season of Supergirl. It's not like I left because of Supergirl, yeah. but, uh, but like that was around the time that I left. So I worked on the, the Arrow, Flash, Gotham on Fox, iZombie on the CW and Constantine on NBC. And so, and then I had, I had a hand in development on a couple other pilots, which of course now I all forget. Um, but yeah, but there was some stuff that was sort of float, floating around there. And uh, yeah, and, and yeah, and that was, and that was, I mean, that was when I learned how television works. So, um, so that was, it was a very, and very intense learning process, but I'm really grateful for it. It was a one of a kind education. I definitely couldn't, you definitely couldn't find it anywhere else. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be a lot of fun, man. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're uh, exercising muscles um, that you hadn't had a chance to do yet, too, which would be pretty yeah. cool. Too. Yeah, yeah, it was very much the businessy side of it. It was like you know, uh, selling stuff, giving notes to giving notes on stuff, uh, 
framing framing things. It was very, very, it was very, very interesting. It was very, very interesting. It was less, even though I was, I was putting in a lot of scripts and giving a lot of notes, it was less what I was used to from complex editing, where it was just me and a writer and an artist figuring out, okay, let's make a story and 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 you know build that and, and let's ha- give it an audience kind of thing. Yeah. There were so many there were so many more movie pieces in television that being a TV executive it is very much, and for me, being a TV executive is figuring out like how do I exist within all that while at the same time making the making the end product better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. Are, are you? Um, do you have anything to do with some of the HBO stuff that's going on right now, um, like Green Lantern or any of the other properties that are? I was on. Uh, okay, uh, I was on A Incarnation. Okay. of the Green Lantern, uh, Green Lantern show, but I'm not on the current incarnation, which I think they've announced exists, but they haven't announced anything past that. Yeah. So I'm going to stay safe and not, I don't think I know anything officially anyway. Uh, I have guesses, I think. So I don't think, I, I, I think my, I treat my guesses as if they're they're true, but I don't actually know anything. So yeah, let's not get uh, you in trouble, porn set. Let's not get you in yeah, trouble. Yeah, I appreciate but that. I am a big Green Lantern that. fan, and I thought I saw your name attached to that. I, I, I thought, yeah, I know, I see that <laughs> shelf, I like, see that shelf. And you're like, <laughs> yes, no, I was, I, I was in a writer's room for Green Lantern for a while. It was a really fun time. Unfortunately, yeah. it is the way these things work. It, it was like pre-James Gunn, and so like when James Gunn came on board, like all that stuff kind of get, did did a big do over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, understood, understood. All right, porn sec. The real reason why you're here, um, yeah. we have Man's Best coming up, which looks yes. like a lot of fun. I had a blast talking to Jesse, who's just oh, a good human being, by the way. He just 100%. the nicest guy ever, man. Nicest guy. Yeah, he's awesome. I love working with Jesse. He's fantastic. He's yeah. fantastic. It's been great. I think, you know, uh, the thing I love about just working in comics, and I've always sort of said this, is like comics is this great place for me to like hang out with old friends and make new ones. And Jesse was a new friend. Uh, you know, I, we met through the book and now we talk like every other week and we, and we talk like for like work for like five minutes and then we're, most of we're just talking about everything else and just talking about our lives and, you know, whatever. And so he's been a great person to get to know. It's been a great, he's got such a singular approach to comics. So just being able to work with him, it, it, it is, I feel so lucky and it's such a privilege to be able to sit next to him so I can see his approach to comics and look at how he looks at a page and thinks about, like, I find it all, as a fan of comics, I find his work so fascinating. I mean, I, he would be embarrassed to hear me say this, but like, I think it's like impossible to be a fan of comics and not be a fan of like what he does because it's so unique. It so plays with the form. It, it, it's, yeah, so I just think it's all just so cool. Yeah, he has such an, a, a unique um style of art yeah that yeah. is much different than a lot of stuff that most fans see out there which is perfect for a book like this um i i just feel like i don't know he's so talented i, I had such a blast talking to him can you talk a little bit of, about where the story man's best started like how did that come sure up? sure so for me like so man's best is i describe it as homeward bound in space it's about these three emotional support animals that are living on a spaceship spaceship crashes and then their crew is captured, their human crew is captured. And now they have to sort of go save them. And they're dressed up in these like little mech outfits. So the cat's in cat mech. And we got a bionic dog. And we got a, bull, a, bull, a golden, a bionic golden retriever. And a bulldog with a rocket strapped on its back. And their their owner uh, is just sort of like ma- the, the resident ship's mad scientist. Who pretty much put all this on their pets. Because it was just a really cute way to like, you know, waste time. In kind of the same way that like dog, like I can, I, I've seen so many videos at this point of dogs in like UPS outfits and like Chucky serial killer outfits and, you know, and pretending to run and chase things. So she sort of, you know, strapped herself up to her, her pets for the, the same reason. So now her pets think like, oh my God, like this is training. We're clearly supposed to save them now that they're in. And they kind of go through this like sort of alien planet. And it's a story about, you know, where the people or the creatures that we go to for hope and inspiration go when they need hope and inspiration. And I really, you know, it's very different from what I normally do. I usually write that I'm, I, I consider myself a horror writer at heart. Uh, and I brought that into the good Asian with some, some noir. Yeah. And, and, and this is literally the inverse of that. And it's inverse in kind of the way I sort of approached it too. For me, what horror is about is it's about, the the best way 
to scare someone is to show them something unfamiliar or even to take things that they know and make it feel unfamiliar. When we were doing Infido, you know, even though that's a book with ghosts and demons, we never mention the words ghosts and demons anywhere in that book. And we don't do it primarily because the second you get a word to wrap your head around it, it loses a little bit of its strength. There is fear in the unfamiliar. But the, the flip side of that, though, is this idea then that the world being big is a scary place is a bad place because the world is big. And so I wanted to approach, I, I think a part of it was coming out of the pandemic and in part of just being in this, these times that we are that are so contentious, where I wanted to go back to this idea that the world being big is a wondrous place. It's a fast, it's a fast, and that was kind of what original science fiction was based on. There's a Ray Bad Bradbury quote, which I think we'll make into the first issue, that is, talks about space travel has made children of us all. And that's what really is like what the book is, is this idea of, you know, these small creatures looking at how big the world is. And yes, they're scared at, about it, but there's also something wondrous about that. There's something to celebrate about that as well. But at the same time, also acknowledging the fact that there is danger and, and, and menace and a threat just because the world is, because there is so much unknown. So a lot of it for me, it really was the opposite of a horror story, and I approached it in the opposite of a horror story, in that I wanted the, uh, I, I wanted the, the bigness and the, the unknownness to be a sense of wonder as opposed to a sense of, of fear and, and trepidation, which is not, and to do that without, without acknowledging the fact that with this wonder, there is a sense of danger and, and menace. And so that's kind of where the book kind of came from. And a lot of it sort of came from too, you know, and this goes back to the Homeward Bounds of it all. You know, Homeward Bound was a story about friendship. And coming out of the pandemic, I had just watched me drift away from friends. And and so many of it, too, was that the story is very much about these three best friends who grew up at a time, you know, in, a, in an environment where they were safe. And then they get thrust into crisis. And they watch as Christ, as their quirky little differences threaten to pull them apart because all of a sudden they're a very big deal in their crisis. So that was very much me sort of reacting coming out of the pandemic of like watching that happen to the people I knew and sort of my friends. And I wanted to have a story that talked about that. I wanted to have a story in the same way that Homeward Bound was a story about friendship. I wanted to tell the story about friendship that was, that was a little bit more updated for these very contentious times that we're looking at of just like how, when you don't see eye to eye with people that you care about, how do you man? Can you stay together? You know, what does it take to stay together? Uh, can you get through that together? And that's kind of those are the questions at the heart of the book. Yeah, I mean, and I, we do that with like you know, animals versus robots and animals versus characters with hammer in their heads and all that kind of stuff. I, I think you're pulling on a lot of uh, emotional triggers that I think we all could relate to um, yeah. as well, which I, I I hope right creates that kind of connection with that story immediately. Hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. That's always kind of the goal. I mean, that was kind of it for me where that that's why that story and as I'm writing that story, that those are the things that I'm sort of thinking about and trying to sort of dig dig deeper into. And, and, and like you said, like hopefully people see that and respond to that in, 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 yeah, in, in their own ways. Yeah, absolutely. Did it, Was it kind of a relieving going into a genre that you normally don't touch? Was it or did it, it feel it, weird and you're like, nah, I don't know. It's scary. It's always scary for me. It is always, always very scary. And and especially for this, I kind of had to throw out a lot of the tricks I had sort of built up in my last two books. And that's kind of the reason to do it, too. Uh, you know, it's just to pick up some new tricks. So I threw out a lot of tricks and I had to learn some new tricks in order to do it. And it's very scary because uh, for me anyway, because I feel like once I the tricks work for a reason, they're there so nobody can see what a hack I am. And now that I've thrown them out, it, it becomes a lot more obvious. And so, so yeah, so, but, um, but yeah, but that's part of the, the, the it, it, it is a challenge. It is very nerve wracking. It's very, very nerve wracking. I'm, I'm almost at the end of finishing the series at this point. And I just now feel like, okay, I think I, 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 I think I feel comfortable, but, uh, but so much of the process is me getting comfortable and, and, and all that. Now, my understanding, is it going to be a, a four-part series to start off with? Five. A oh, five, five. Five issues. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, and then we'll see what happens from there. Absolutely. So there, it is a little open-ended to kind of see maybe the story can continue or... It 
could. I, I, I have to have that conversation. It's funny, this, this more so than anything I've worked on is uh, a co-collaboration with Jesse. And so, so he has, in, even though the story is mine, he has input on so many different aspects. And so the script definitely changes after it gets to him and after I, I incorporate his feedback. So I could see ways it could go forward in a very different incarnation because big things happen in five issues. Um, but Jesse might not agree. And uh, Jesse might be like, no, that doesn't work. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, right. And so, uh, so yeah, so we haven't talked about sort of beyond that. But, but, but I, I kind of, I, it's funny, everything I write to me always feels very closed ended. And then by the time I finish it, I'm just like, oh, wait, I can see more. Uh, but while I'm writing it, I never, it, it take, I have to get to the end. And then when I get to the end, it's like, oh, yeah, I can, I can see more. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I can't wait for it to come out um, for those that uh, do listen to this podcast. Uh, so the FOC is 226. So you need to get into your yes. local comic book store and tell them to make sure that that is on your pull list. So plenty of time to get this thing ordered. And then it arrives in your local comic book store on the 20th of March. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. Awesome, man. That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I can't, and it's through Boom, right? So this is a Boom Studios yes. uh is this your first time working with Boom? Yeah, it's my yeah. first time working with Boom. Uh, yeah, no, I it uh, I've owed Eric Harburn, uh, the editor, one of the executive editor, a favor forever, and uh, and and this is me finally, uh, finally uh, making good on that. And it's been great. I mean, he was the one that brought me and Jesse together. I never would have thought to reach out to Jesse just because I'm such a huge fan of his work, and I just would have assumed that he didn't want to work with the writers. And I think that was the first thing I said to Eric when Eric was like, what about Jesse Lana again? I'm like, oh my God, I love Jesse Lana again. Does, why would he work, like, why would he work with anyone that isn't him? His stuff is already so good. And uh, and then we found out he was open, he was at that phase in his career where he's interested in working with other writers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that he did a, a virgin and a, I think, cover A um, for Man's yeah. Best and that cover of the three, uh, oh, so yeah. good, man, he is incredible artist, incredible artist. Yeah. He's so, so, so good. And yeah, his stuff is so good. It's so, it's such, he's so good as an illustrator. He's so good as a conceptual designer, but his comics, like just how his comics works are so good. Like, again, I can't say it enough. Like, his, his grammar and his understanding of how comics work, it, it's its so fascinating that it's hard not to, if you love comics, I have a hard time thinking, how can you not love Jesse's sort of stuff? Because he so interrogates how comics works with his use of the form. Absolutely. I think uh, he worked on uh, Miss Truesdale, I think was one of his last yes. times that he did, which yeah. was an incredible uh um, yeah. series man so yeah i mean i think you two are a dynamic duo i'm really excited for man's best um and uh, yeah march 20th i can't wait for it to come out man thank you man i really appreciate that i really appreciate it yeah what i'm else? excited to very curious to hear what people think yeah absolutely Porset, what else are you working on outside of that is there anything that you're working on that you want to share or not nothing really to share yet I can't. I have another project coming out through Image later this year, but I don't think I can talk about it yeah. just yet. Part of my problem is I can never seem to talk about what I'm. I, I <laughs> yeah. I, I do these projects like one at a time, yeah. so I can never. When I'm promoting one, I can never talk about the next one because it's too far away. No, understood, understood. Yeah. And how can people follow you, um, Porn Sack, if they want to follow your career and everything that you're working on? Yeah, so I've made it like as complicated as possible for people. <laughs> I am at real underscore porn sack on Twitter. I'm real underscore P sack on Instagram. And then I'm just porn sack on Blue Sky. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I made it as absolutely as, as, as absolutely as com more, more complicated than it needs to be. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll put all of those uh, tags <laughs> underneath in the description so that way people can follow you very easily. But Porn sack. I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate you coming on today to talk about man's best and your amazing career. Um, I can't wait. Hopefully um, we can have you back on when you are able yeah. to talk about your next project. With yeah, I'd love to. Amazing. Yeah. Big fan of your work, Porn sack. You're uh, you. you're a very talented uh, comic book creator and writer. And uh, man, congratulations on man's best. I can't wait to read it. Thank you, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you, uh, Porn Sack, and we will talk soon, my friend. Talk soon. Bye. <laughs>